So we have two speakers today. We're happy to be doing this webinar in conjunction with our partners from Emphasis. Uh, Dr. Jay Ganesh is heads research and innovation at Emphasis. He's the SVP and head of the research and innovation uh, department at Emphasis. He's an award-winning digital transformation and innovation leader with expertise in leading technology strategy, organizational innovation, R&D, new product and service innovations. Jay is a prolific inventor. He has over 15 granted patents and also is an industry leading thought leader with publications in peer reviewed journals and conferences. Jay has his PhD from the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, holds an MBA and is a recipient of the Chevening Rolls-Royce Science and Innovation Fellowship at the University of Oxford. Uh, after Jay presents, we will have Alex Condello, who is the manager of algorithms, performance and tools at D-Wave. His responsibilities include the Ocean Quantum Software Development Kit, which is D-Wave's suite of quantum tools, benchmarking, the development of hybrid algorithms that combine classical and quantum resources and professional services. Alex earned a master's of applied science in mathematics from Queen's University in Canada. And with that, uh, we would like uh, Jay to come on camera and he will start his presentation. Thank you, Susan. And uh... Good evening, good morning, um, good afternoon, everyone. I was looking at the chat window, window about all the participants and I truly see all the continents and several countries being represented. Thank you for attending the webinar. Uh, and uh, between me and Alex, we will try to keep you engaged as much as possible uh, and we'll share uh, what experience we have gathered in the quantum space. The specific focus on uh, financial services. Let me start the slides. So these are uh, the five broad areas uh, we plan to cover in today's session. It's a one hour session. Uh, we will start with a very brief introduction of quantum computing for those who are uh, new to this, uh, to this area. We'll straight away jump into business application. So that is where, uh, where we find application of quantum for various industry verticals. And today's session is mainly focused on financial services. So we'll spend some time on talking about some of these uh, application of uh, quantum computing of financial services. So we have been we're doing a lot of experiments uh, and POCs on applying quantum on industry relevant use cases in financial services. So whatever we're going to share today will be based on actual experience in terms of implementing some of these solutions on quantum systems, particularly leveraging DWIP systems. We will talk about one of the quantum frameworks we have built, which will essentially uh, make life easier if you're a quantum developer uh, of uh, you know, all the data pre-processing required before we bring uh, this, uh, you know, the data to the quantum systems. I'll then hand it over to Alex. He will talk you through uh, some examples and uh, some of the practical quantum computing scenarios, which he is leading at D-Wave. Finally, you'll we'll come back to me and I'll talk through a few demos. So these demos will be a very interesting part where we'll actually run a live quantum algorithm uh, based on an actual uh, industry scenario. So we, we picked up uh, financial services, portfolio optimization, uh, anomaly detection, financial services, and uh, route optimization and logistics as three use cases uh, where we'll walk you through the use cases and let's show the demo. Uh, just like Susan mentioned, there is a Q&A section. You can ask any questions during the presentation. We have uh, Rohit, David, and Alex who are uh, manning the Q&A window. They'll be answering questions. You don't need to wait till the end of the session for asking questions. We will also be picking up some questions uh, towards the end for detailed discussion. So let me start with uh, a brief introduction about the evolution of computing itself. So. We all have seen and read these across uh, several publications and discussion forums in terms of how we started from vacuum tubes to transistors to ICs to microprocessors and crunching more and more of transistors uh, and making uh, you know the entire uh, Moore's law run uh, you know for a few more years. So the industry is at a cusp where uh, there are limitations to the Moore's law, which is which are being circumvented by invention of uh, new uh, you know, materials, which can essentially prolong the life. So the industry is at a stage where new materials and more innovations are happening on the traditional computing side, which are pushing the boundaries. At the same time, 
we are at a stage where quantum systems are emerging and growing in popularity in parallel because of the fact that they are available and accessible for a lot more developers at the ground level. For those who have tinkered with the D-Wave systems available on the cloud, you must, you must know that you can, uh, it's as simple as accessing any cloud application and you can start using those quantum systems through the cloud uh, very, very easily. So we are at a stage where the industry is uh, seeing increasing adoption and we, we believe the pace is going to increase uh, in the next few years and we will see more and more of practical quantum applications in real life. A very, very quick introduction uh, to what quantum is for those who are new to this area. Um, you know, there are some few often discussed terms which you find for the sake of repetition. Let me just quickly walk them through them. Quantum computers uh, store bits in the form of qubits. You know, if, you are, if you're familiar with traditional classical computing, the information is stored as bits, which is binary, zeros and ones. Whereas qubits can store this information across multiple states. So these are these states, the qubits exist and are known, uh, you know, this is this phenomenon is known as superposition, where simultaneously you can be in multiple states at the same time. And this gives you uh, the ability to manipulate these qubits in previously unknown fashion, right? So imagine uh, a system which can exist in multiple states at once, right? So from a classical thinking point of view, this is even difficult to comprehend how such a phenomena can exist, right? So that is what we're discussing from a quantum uh, physics perspective. These states with the qubits existing are manipulated using precision lasers and microwave uh, beams. So that's what happens when you open the, uh, you know, the inerts of a quantum system for the matter. So this is, uh, you know, it is cooled at a very low temperature, it is manipulated using lasers, and all the other science behind it. So, and, and most importantly, a quantum computer with several qubits in superposition can crunch through vast numbers of potential outcomes simultaneously because you're existing in multiple states, you're able to manipulate data because you're not constrained by just zeros and one. There are many, many possibilities you can experiment with. Essentially a very, very probabilistic computing approach rather than a deterministic zero and one based computing approach. The second interesting phenomena is entanglement. Right? So quantum computation qubits are also entangled together, which essentially means that changing one qubit or uh, influencing one qubit can influence the state of the other qubit. Right? It's almost like the butterfly effect, where a butterfly, uh, you know, wings, uh, you know, fluttering in one part of the world is causing a tsunami in some other parts of the world. A bit difficult to comprehend, but that's what is happening in the quantum entanglement state, where uh, you know, is one qubit state, uh, qubit uh, position influences another qubit, right? And and this is uh, essentially a very very important uh, phenomena which is being leveraged when you want to leverage the power of quantum superposition and entanglement are two important characteristics which we leverage for building our algorithms, for testing our algorithms, and of course getting all the uh, you know, jump up exponential benefits we get out of uh, leveraging quantum systems for, uh, for, uh, for, for solving a lot of the problems. So these two, uh, three areas which I mentioned, quantum superposition, I'm just reiterating the few points, is a feature where a system exists in several separate states at the same time. I spoke about this. Similarly, entanglement is what Einstein called a spooky action at a distance, where two particles or objects seem to affect one another regardless of the range or how far they are, how far apart they are from each other. And finally, coherence is where the quantum system maintains a superposition and interference. This can be milliseconds or tens of seconds or even minutes. The more coherence time you get, the more steps you can do. As you know that quantum systems are extremely fragile and you need to be in a coherent state. Incoherence means that you're losing the stability of the system. So you need to be in a coherent state. And that's why the systems, the quantum computers themselves are maintained at very, very low temperatures, free from the Earth's magnetic field and gravity and all the other forces. So they need to be extremely, uh, you know, maintained extremely uh, carefully. Now, let's look at a few steps in the working of a quantum algorithms, because this is important, because if you're looking at traditional classical computing and classical programming approach, 
there are some variations in the way you you are programming uh, when you're looking at quantum algorithm. This could be a machine learning program, or it could be an optimization for problem, or it could be a, a simulation uh, problem. Now, the first step in in the steps of working of a quantum algorithm is that you encode the input data into the state of a set of qubits. Basically, you are bringing in the data. The data needs to be uh, something which you need to pass it to the qubits so that you can actually make sure uh, you can leverage the power of the quantum system. So this is all about bringing the qubits into superposition. This is the quantum superposition I, I spoke about earlier, where you're actually loading the data which you're going to analyze downstream. And that data could be as simple as an anomaly deduction algorithm from a machine learning perspective, or it could be a route optimization algorithm, or it could be a quantum uh, financial services portfolio optimization. Once you have brought about uh, you know, the, the, the qubits in the superposition state, you're applying the algorithms to all the states. So this is where the quantum entanglement is leveraged. And, and, you, and mind you, one of those states holds the right answer. Like I said, quantum systems are probabilistic in nature. They, there can be multiple answers, but you got to choose the right answer and measure it at a certain point of time. And many of the times you, you run this algorithm several times, several hundred times or several thousand times till the time you find the right answer you're looking for. Interference amplifies the probability and arrives at the right state you're looking at. And finally, you measure the output, which has got the highest probability. Like I said, you know, quantum algorithms are run multiple times and each repetition is called a shot. And every time you get a result and you take the best result, which is essentially satisfying the requirement you're looking for. And that's the result could be across any of the algorithms you're trying to run on a quantum system. Now, what are some of the key benefits of quantum systems? So these are the key benefits we are seeing at the ground level. So this is not just what you find uh, you know, uh, as stated benefits. These are actual measured ground level benefits which we see when we are running several of the algorithms on quantum systems. So we are seeing reduced time of uh, crunching data and getting a result. So this is an important uh, benefit when you're looking at uh, you know, machine learning problems or even optimization problems where you are trying to train large amounts of data. And, uh, and, and of course, when you're when you running a complex optimization problem or a portfolio optimization problem, you are looking at getting the results at a very short duration. You're not looking at waiting forever to get the results. So this is where quantum computers perform extremely well because they leverage the characteristics of the block sphere, right? Essentially, it is reducing the search space of parameters and you're able to get better results uh, at a very reduced time duration. So you are, we, we have actually benchmarked a number of these results and many of the times is an exponential improvement in the time needed to go from a problem uh, formulation to an entire result itself. We're getting optimal solution in many of the cases, which is an important benefit because uh, like I said, you know, uh, when you're looking at uh, solving a complex problem, you are essentially looking at getting the best solution and quantum tunneling helps here and finally, we are getting improved prediction uh, for several scenarios uh, you know, using a quantum system. So these benefits are something which are quantified. We have done uh, you know, several dozen experiments across various industry scenarios, and we invariably see several use cases where uh, you know, these benefits are actually transcribed at the ground level. Let's look at a few application of quantum computing for financial services. I spoke about quantum computing has having broad applications across a number of areas like chemistry, physics, mathematics, computing, biology, et cetera. So today's discussion, we're going to focus on applying uh, you know, the benefit of quantum computing for a certain industry vertical, and most importantly, looking at how industry can leverage quantum computing at the ground level today uh, by leveraging the power which uh, D-Wave brings to the table uh, through uh, their systems. So there are a few industry areas which are primed for quantum disruption and quantum adoption. And these are scenarios like optimization, like financial portfolio optimization. I will spoke, speak more about that in today's discussion. Logistics, road optimization, manpower optimization, et cetera. These are problem areas prime for a quantum intervention. Machine learning scenarios like anomaly detection, uh, a large data problem where you're looking at anomalies in credit card data or transactions data, prime candidate for a quantum intervention. Financial risk analytics, natural language processing, image analytics. These are all scenarios we're getting superlative results using a quantum system. Simulation, areas like risk modeling, climate modeling, again, a prime candidate for quantum intervention. Cybersecurity, not a day goes without looking at a news article which talks about the impending 
uh, uh, you know, um, um, the maturity of the quantum system and how e easily they can crack the crypt cryptographic code. So cybersecurity becomes an important area of interest for several industry verticals uh, for leveraging the power of quantum. If you take financial services, there are a number of areas where industry uh, leaders and uh, startups are adopting quantum, uh, quantum computers for solving industry problems. So this slide essentially talks about some of those interesting problems where uh, you, you are actually seeing a large scale adoption. Cryptography I spoke about macroeconomic forecasting, where you're looking at modeling dozens or hundreds or thousands of variables. This is where uh, quantum computers work really well when you're looking at uh, forecasting these complex uh, you know, variables. Market simulations, risk analysis, these are all areas where uh, you, know, you, you find applicability of quantum computers. Portfolio management, you, you'll actually see the power of quantum computers when I walk you through the actual live demo of portfolio management where we leverage the power of quantum for a live scenario. Credit scoring is another area, anomaly detection and fraud prevention. Because of the fact that you're able to uh, look at large amounts of data, it could be time series data, it could be uh, you know, uh, data coming at a very fast pace, it could be credit card transactions or even banking transactions, you're able to identify anomalies much more accurately with very, very less number of false positives. Security pricing, treasury management, these are all areas where you're seeing adoption of quantum computing across industry verticals. And these scenarios, are something you can start experimenting with today because you have uh, machines available, you have several algorithms available, there are open source communities, uh, and, and it's easy uh, you know, to actually start looking at these scenarios because data sets are available. You can start by applying some of those basic machine learning problems or even some of the interesting optimization problems by leveraging the power of quantum systems. Now, I spoke about some of the scenarios. These are examples of actual companies who are leveraging uh, the power of quantum to solve actual problems. So this is all based on secondary data from various news articles and sources. Portfolio optimization is one area you're finding maximum adoption across several industry verticals because of the fact that you know portfolio optimization is a complex problem. You are looking at optimizing several factors and variables and you need to get to the results very fast. And you're looking at a large number of uh, historical stock data, and you're looking at various permutations and combinations. So that is one use case where you're finding a number of industry leaders adopting quantum for solving uh, that particular problem. Credit screening is another problem area we're looking uh, at uh, people, uh, you know, industry leaders have adopted. Similarly, uh, loan portfolio optimization, security pricing, and trading strategies. So these, this is just a, this is just an illustrative list of uh, you know peop, uh, key players adopting quantum computing for financial services. If you search around, you'll find a lot more examples. But some of these examples are at a very very early stages. But if you look at something like portfolio optimization, you're actually able to see results and very very solid results at the ground level. Now, if you look at technology choices when you are looking at adopting quantum, there are two types of uh, computing systems. Uh, you know, uh, uh, from a quantum computing perspective, the one is uh, annealer-based systems, and of course, uh, gate-based systems. D-Wave, we are going to talk more about annealer-based systems. Both of them have their own benefits and disadvantages. But if you look at uh, the the, the, the D-Wave advantage systems and some of the leap systems, they're extremely powerful. They're easy to build, and we we are seeing fantastic results on using annealer-based systems. So. So most of the examples I, I speak about from a demo perspective towards the end are, are solutions we have built on annealer-based systems, uh, you know, using D-Wave systems. Uh, let me speak a bit about the emphasis uh, energy optimized network. I spoke about the complexity of uh, quantum computing in terms of limited number of qubits available because of the fact that the, uh, the number of qubits are just not enough for solving complex problems. And most importantly, the data needs to be pre-processed before you brought in, bring in this data to a quantum hardware, because you cannot just straight away bring in the data to a quantum system. It needs to be brought ready uh, so that you can do the benefit, you can do the manipulations around superposition and entanglement, et cetera. So the data needs to be pre-processed. So at Emphasis, we are working on is, uh, the, a solution called Emphasis Eon, which is an energy optimized network, which takes care of this complexity of pre-processing and feature engineering of data uh, for machine learning systems and an equivalent uh, pre-processing from an optimization perspective as well. So this, the framework reduces the feature dimensionality, which essentially means that 
you're able to leverage uh, you know, the power of the system and get better results with a limited number of qubits you're able to uh, leverage. And it also takes care of the pre-processing of data. So this is how Yon works. Uh, it takes care of the entire steps from a pre uh, feature engineering and pre-processing perspective. When you're looking at any of those problem scenarios you spoke about, the data which is brought about is passed through Eon framework. It takes care of all the uh, you know complexities of the data so that the data is ready uh, to be brought into a quantum system. So it it reduces the time taken from a developer uh, to to manipulate all the data pre-processing activities. And using Eon, we are seeing better results. Uh, you know, from a training time, needing fewer qubits, and reduce information loss across the board for several other scenarios we're talking about. I spoke about the the steps in the working of a quantum algorithm, and this is how uh, Eon fits in. It it takes it it's sort of in between the loading stages of data pre-processing and the uh, the feature engineering scenario, particularly for machine learning type of uh, problems. A few points to consider. I know I'm uh, short of time. I need to hand it over to Alex. Few points to consider while adopting quantum computing. It is revolutionizing the way we are approaching quantum uh, computer science and logic. So be ready to look at new algorithms. Be ready to look at rewriting traditional algorithms to suit computing systems. So we are, we are in for some exciting times because we're going to change a lot of the traditional assumptions and traditional systems which have served us for many, many years. New programming paradigms and languages are emerging. New algorithms are emerging and most importantly, exciting new ways of lo writing logic as emerging because you're going to leverage new fundamental computing features like superposition, entanglement, et cetera. Quantum computers are extremely powerful, but they're not for all problems. So they are, there are certain types of problems that are best suited from a quantum computing perspective. These are problems typically optimization, machine learning simulation, they're well suited from a quantum computing perspective. It is not for all problems, but there are certain problems that are extremely powerful to be leveraged by uh, quantum systems. They're not a replacement for classical system. They will continue to exist. They continue to coexist. For a certain set of problems, QC, quantum computers are much more powerful and much more relevant, and they can give you disruptive advantage. So the next part is the demos uh, and the uh, use cases, which you come back in a few minutes. So I'll first hand it over to Alex. Uh, he, will, he will finish his part of the presentation and come back, and I will come back with uh, a few demos and uh, some live examples. Alex, over to you. Great, thanks. Let me just share my screen here. All right, uh, thanks and good to see everyone here. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit, I'm gonna be doing a demo from the D-Wave side to give you a little bit of an idea of how we approach different problems and how we use our quantum and hybrid systems in order to solve those problems. But before I sort of jump in with the examples, I wanna say this is a really good time to be starting to get involved with quantum computing. You know, we have, uh, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, we've worked hard to develop practical quantum computers that are here now and available to you to be using in your business applications. We've also been developing hybrid solvers, and I'm going to be talking about hybrid solvers quite a bit later, but I'm going to define it really quickly right now as any solver that makes use of both classical and quantum resources together to give you the best of both worlds for solving problems. Since our launch of the Advantage product this year, and since the launch of our, our hybrid solvers about a year and a half ago, we have been able to approach a huge number of customer problems, including in spaces like logistics, in uh, molecular simulation, and in portfolio optimization. I'm going to be talking about some of those in more detail. But before I jump into some of these more lofty examples, I would like to start with a relatively small motivating example to give you all a sense of how we think about solving problems on our system. And the example that I want to run with is pipelines. Imagine that you have a network of pipelines and you can see such a network pictured on the right hand side. And these pipelines are joined at various junctions. What I would like to do is I would like to find a minimum set of junctions from which I can monitor every single pipeline. Now, you might be looking at this problem at this graph and you might be saying, okay, you know, I can probably do this in my head, but I will tell you that as this thing gets larger, this becomes an increasingly difficult problem. And in fact, it's actually an example of an NP hard problem. That's one that's exponentially difficult for classical computers to be able to approach. So, as I said, I wanna be able to find, if I wanna go about solving this problem, I wanna be able to find this 
minimum set of junctions. And actually, this is a really well studied problem in computer science. This is called a minimum vertex cover problem. The tool that we would like to solve this problem with, the tool that we need to solve this problem with if we want to use our quantum computer directly, is the so-called binary quadratic model. This is the tool that we use to solve it. And, and that's a lot of verbiage, but just to break that down a little bit, um, binary means that we each of the variables in our solution need to be binary. Yes, no, red, blue, uh, left side, right side, or say uh, junction monitor, junction not monitor. The quadratic implies that we need to have some sort of pairwise relationship between our decision variables, between the variables in our problem, which again, in the context of the pipeline is, you know, our pipes are pairwise. They have two junctions on, on either side. That's a quadratic interaction. And model is a throwaway term that, you know, we in math and computer science like to apply to things like binary and quadratic because otherwise it wouldn't seem like a full phrase. So, Linking that back to our pipeline example, you can actually see, as I mentioned, this in action. We have a set of binary variables, that is, each junction either has a sensor or no. We have a set of quadratic interactions, that is, each pipeline, which touches on two different sensors, quadratic, needs at least one sensor. And we finally have some sort of linear objective, which is that we want to minimize the total number of sensors on the pipeline. And you can actually see on the bottom right, uh, how we encode this problem as a binary quadratic model, and therefore how we can solve this on our quantum computer. So hopefully a tiny bit of a taste of how we, how we think about solving problems, but to, in order to solve problems on a quantum computer, we actually need quite a deep stack in order to do that. You know, you need a quantum computer at the bottom of it. That's, that's important. That's kind of essential for quantum computing. But just having a quantum computer, you know, a little a little uh, wafer that's kept at 15 millikelvin in in, uh, in a system that's, um, you know, isn't all that useful in and of itself. You're also going to need cloud-based access. You're going to need to be able to actually access this from anywhere in the world. Um, you're going to need real-time access. You're going to need schedulers. You're going to need uh, an ability to decrement quota. You're going to need an ability to determine, uh, you know, to, to figure out how long it's going to take. And you need a user interface. You need an interface that will allow you to see statistics on your usage and allow you to submit problems and allow you to build frameworks like Eon that Dr. J was mentioning earlier that allow you to build these more complex applications on top of this stack. And so rather than sort of tell you all about Leap, which is, which is our online stack, um, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a live demo of some of the things that I was mentioning before. And where I want to start this demo is right here on our dashboard. So if you sign up for one of our free LEAP accounts, which you can go do right now and get free access to our quantum and hybrid solvers, um, you will land here on the dashboard. Alternatively, if you are a business and you have an enterprise uh, uh, set up with our system, you would follow a link in your, in your uh, welcome email and it would bring you right here. So this is sort of the landing place for quantum computing with D-Wave. And you know, I won't be able to go through all the great features here, but you can see some things like the amount of usage you've done on the solvers. You can see problems that you've submitted. You can see what solvers you have available. We have access to a lot of great resources. We have a community, we have documentation, we have a set of interactive demos, which sort of go through in more detail um, some of how we think about solving. But the thing that I actually wanna hone in on right now is our library of code examples that implement various problems um, that you can actually select by industry uh, or application type or different solving techniques. So you can actually go through this set of examples, which we're adding to all the time, and find examples that are close to your use case and see that we, how we at D-Wave go about solving this problem so that you can you know, use that as a starting point for your application. And you can see exactly how you can map your problem onto our, onto our system. And in fact, um, we can actually find an old friend. Uh, I talked about this pipelines earlier. We can actually see how D-Wave solves this problem, not just in slide form, but actually in math and in code. So when I, when I click on this, I can see some details. I can see, and I can actually go straight to, the, to GitHub, which is where you can find the online open source code that implements this problem. But we can actually do something even cooler, which is that we can open up this library, this package, in our online integrated developer environment, uh, IDE. 
This IDE is a full featured development environment for building applications against our quantum computer and our hybrid solvers. This has Ocean, which is our open source tools for accessing the system pre-installed. It has your access pre-configured. It has you know, everything you might need to develop code on a quantum computing system. And when I open up, I can actually see here's our pipeline again. It's a little, looks a little bit, I think, backwards, but you know, you can you can hopefully recognize it. You can see the solution. And I can actually run this problem live on the quantum computer simply by implementing a uh, you know, by running a Python program. And when I do that, uh, this is going to this is running real time on one of our online quantum computers. That remains cool to me almost every time that I can uh, actually access a quantum computer in real time like that. And we can go ahead and see uh, the solution that the quantum computer found, which it refound one of the minimum vertex covers for this problem, which is exactly what we want to see in the case of the quantum computer. I might also be interested in knowing, you know, a little bit more. How, like, what did this actually? Well, how did this interact with the system? What did this look like? And actually, if I want to look into that, I can edit this this code in real time to understand how this interacted with the system. And so as an example, if I was interested in seeing how this mapped to the system, I can um, import a couple extra tools. Uh, um, and I can use this to view the problem that was submitted to the system. And I can just by doing So live coding is always fun. So let's go ahead and save that. We'll rerun the program. Hope that I didn't make any typos. Um, and if I didn't, this time, we're not only going to run the problem and we're not only going to see the solution, but we're also going to be able to see how this mapped directly to the quantum computer using our inspector, which I can actually do here. So this is our inspector for viewing how the quantum computer was used. And we can actually see here, this is our pipeline network. I promise this is that same network. It's just a bit twisted around. Um, but I can see how this mapped directly to the quantum computer. I can see that this particular junction, junction one, was mapped to this qubit on our one of our 2000 cube quantum computers. So you can actually see it used quite a small portion of the quantum computer. We had a lot more. We could solve a much bigger network on the system. But you, know, you can get an idea of how these different variables connected and how they mapped to the system and what biases we chose. And you can use this also to debug you know, maybe common issues that might have arisen uh, that make that because we know that using a quantum computer directly can be complicated. So, okay, pipelines, I've hopefully given you a little bit of an idea of how we think about solving it mathematically. I've shown how you can look and at how we solve this with Ocean, and you can maybe, you know, make changes and, and inspect how we uh, make use of that using the quantum computer. But next, I want to show you maybe an example that's a little bit larger and, and perhaps a little bit more practical. So specifically, I'm going to be looking at resource distribution, um, which is you know a really hot topic these days. But the basic idea, you know, this this page sort of defines in detail the problem. But let's jump right to the fun part. So the problem is this: imagine that I have a collection of hospitals. Say um, you could also imagine you know depots. You could imagine stores or really any other different um, uh, units or that need to have shared resources. And each of these different hospitals, say, will have either a shortage or a surplus of resources, so say beds. The problem is that I would like to group these hospitals in such a way that each grouping has a net surplus of resources, and each grouping is as logistically simple as possible. So, you know, I wouldn't want to group uh, a hospital in the middle of New York and a hospital in the middle of Chicago. And I can actually, so uh, this case, you can actually see a bunch of real live locations of hospitals in uh, New York City. Um, and you can see that, uh, and the actual, the size of the circle indicates how much of a shortage or surplus they have. And the color of the circle indicates whether it's a shortage or surplus, blues or uh, surpluses, reds or shortages. Um, I will say that we, we, we have real locations and we have uh, real sizes, but we've randomly generated the, the surplus or shortage. We don't uh, have data about that, unfortunately. Um, I'll also mention that you know, this example right now looks at 15 hospitals, but we can actually bump this up quite a bit. I could say look at uh, 1,000 hospitals, which covers a pretty good chunk of the Eastern Seaboard. Um, but for the purpose of uh, this demo, I'm going to stick to, uh, let's say, 40 
Um, that's a nice, a nice reasonable number, um, which is, you know, small enough that we can kind of get a sense of what's going on. Um, and I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, start running this problem on the quantum computer. Actually, this time, one of our hybrid solvers, which, as I mentioned before, are solvers that combine the best of both classical and quantum together. So when I submit this problem, rather than running on the quantum computer directly, like I did in the pipelines example, you know, I, you remember I could sort of show you which qubit each uh, junction mapped to. This time, I'm going to be submitting it to a solver that is going to uh, handle all of those details for me and also make use of best in class classical algorithms so that whatever solution, whatever problem I submit, I can get the best of both worlds because there's no point reinventing the classical wheel. Um, quantum computing can provide value, but you know, there's many problems, as Dr. Jane mentioned, that classical computing is, is good for too. So why not use both and we can get the best of both worlds. So, um, you know, as said, while that's running, um, I can also configure things like the partition size. So the groups, the numbers of hospitals that I want to group together. I can also configure the number of neighbors that I want to consider for each hospital. So, you know, I don't want to, as I mentioned, consider a hospital in the middle of New York uh, versus another hospital in the middle of Chicago. I can configure things like our objective function. Um, so I can weight how much I care about the, uh, the, the logistics problem. So how much do I want to worry about um, how difficult it is to group these hospitals? Uh, and how much do I want to, um, how much do I care about uh, the, the net surplus? So you could imagine that maybe the gas price has gone up and therefore, uh, you know, the logistics cost becomes quite a bit uh, heavier. So you can actually see now uh, an example of uh, the solution that was found by our hybrid solver. And you can see some statistics about uh, the solution. So you can see what solver it was run on the leap hybrid solver. You can see the runtime, which was 10 seconds. I know actually that that took a little bit longer than 10 seconds. That was actually because we were building the data set under the hood. Um, so so uh, we only actually have to do that once for this 40 hospital size. But uh, just so you know, it actually only ran on the hybrid solver for about 10 seconds. And you can see the groupings of the, the different solvers. So, um, and you know, it was able to find a solution. So that's, that's always good news. Um, just to finish off this live demo part, I'm actually going to compare this to running on a classical solver. So this time I'm going to be using uh, simulated annealing. Simulated annealing is one of a whole class of different classical algorithms that solve the same problem class as our uh, quantum computer. And we actually include implementations of these algorithms in Ocean, our open source tools, so that you can run these kinds of comparisons and you know, compare for yourself whether uh, quantum or hybrid or classical is providing you the best value uh, on your application. Because you know, as Dr. Jay mentioned, not every application is suitable for quantum or hybrid, but although many, many applications are, and you know, obviously that's why we're, uh, we use them. Ah, and in this case, actually, uh, the classical algorithm wasn't even able to find a feasible solution for this problem. And, and I'll mention that you know, I'm doing this demo live, and sometimes it does. Uh, but I've done this demo. Uh, I'm willing to do this demo live, which will tell you that uh, I am very, very confident, uh, because it's happened every time, that our hybrid solver is able to find a better solution than the, uh, the classical solver. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, jump back to the slide deck real quick. Um, and I just want to hit on a couple of the points that I talked about during the demo with a little bit more detail. Um, so the first thing is I want to talk a little bit more about our hybrid solvers. So one more time, because it's just so important, hybrid solvers combine both classical and quantum resources um, together to, to get both. And we actually have two hybrid solvers available in LEAP right now. We have our binary quadratic model solver. That's the same problem class that I uh, showed you before for the pipelines. But instead of solving, uh, say, 5,000 variable problems, which is the size that can be uh, embedded directly onto our advantage processor, it can solve problems with up to a million variables. And it can, you know, it takes care of a lot of the details around, you know, tuning the, the use of the quantum computer for you. So you don't have to worry about those details. Although we still make use, we still have the quantum computer available to you directly if you, you know, do want to get into involved with that. We also have a discrete quadratic model solver, which is similar to binary quadratic model. You'll recognize most of the words, but instead of binary variables, so junction yes, no. Um, it has discrete variables, so many categorical. So say red, blue, yellow, instead of just two case. Or maybe for junctions, you have, um, you have on, you have monitoring, and you have under repair. 
you don't just have to have two states, you can have as many states as you like. Um, but still that sort of quadratic interaction. We found this to be a really useful generalization uh, when approaching uh, practical customer problems. So an extra little couple words about performance. Um, we have built this hybrid solver uh, system with performance in mind. The whole point of this is that we want to provide value to you and your business uh, so that we can, you know, you can unlock the power of quantum for your applications. And so, you know, you might be asking, uh, so how does it perform? You know, do you have benchmarks that aren't just you doing a live demo? Um, the answer is yes. We have several white papers that are available on our website, and I'm sure we'd be happy to provide the link in the chat, or you could go to our website and check it out. Um, but the highlight is that uh, we use a third-party open source um, benchmarking suite called MQLib, uh, which provides a collection of state-of-the-art solvers that are all competitors, in some sense, to our solver because they solve the same problem, um, as well as a set of different examples uh, or, or problems that you can use to benchmark. And we compared our solutions against, against theirs. And when we did that, we found that we were better than all 27 acoustical heuristics on 87% of the application relevant input. So that's actually extremely good. All of these solvers are heuristics. There's a lovely theorem called the no free lunch theorem, which states that there is no one true solver. Um, so 87% is actually really excellent. Um, I'll also mention that, you know, as the white paper goes into, you might be asking, okay, great, uh, does the quantum computer help? And the answer is yes. Um, we can do, you know, the, the most obvious test, which is to compare uh, just the classical component of our algorithm with the classical component plus the hybrid component. And we find when we do that, that, you know, we get better performance with the hybrid component. So before I hand it back, uh, I just want to touch on really quickly um, a couple examples. We have many, many examples of practical problems that you can use, you can build uh, using Leap. Um, I encourage you to go check out our website to, to see some of those. Um, but just to hit on a couple really quickly, uh, we're, we looked at, we've done portfolio management, which uh, a third party named Multiverse did with DBBA and Bankia, which found that lower turnover rate, that there were lower turnover rates, lower transaction costs, and higher returns, lower volatility when you made use of our systems. Um, we've also looked at logistics problems. So for instance, we worked with Save on Foods, which is a Canadian grocery company, uh, and they found that they were able to save dozens of hours um, in, or, in their logistics problems and solving their logistics problems by making use of our systems. And so with that, uh, I am going to uh, simply suggest that you check out Leap. As I mentioned, you can get free access just by making a free account with our system. You can get real-time access to our quantum and hybrid systems to start building applications right now. And with that, I will pass it back. Thanks, Alex. So the next part is uh, the interesting part of today's discussion where you actually uh, you know, see some business applications of quantum systems. So we will actually run um, uh, the DWF system on a few use cases. Uh, we have chosen two use cases for today's uh, discussion. Uh, the first one is portfolio optimization. Like I said, this is the most popular application of quantum systems in financial services. So we picked it up uh, for today's discussion. Uh, this is the result we're getting uh, in today, uh, you know, the latest experiments we're doing. Uh, and today we'll discuss some of these results. And then, of course, uh, you know, we, we keep experimenting with this, uh, uh, you know, with this scenario on a regular basis, and we're pushing the boundaries in terms of how much of data we can pass to the system, how much of improvement we can get in accuracy, what are the best portfolio we are able to get, et cetera, et cetera. So the, so the experiment we're going to run today is uh, about uh, 30 stocks from a Dow, uh, the, the Dow Jones index, Dow 30. Uh, we are looking at the stock performance uh, for the last five years. So we are going to feed the last five years data to the system. And uh, we have built the portfolio optimization algorithms to the back end. And, uh, and we ran the same experiment for the portfolio optimization for a classical system and a quantum system. So this is the way we run all our experiments so that we know what the results we're getting uh, for both the systems. So this is the results we're getting on an average basis. Uh, the, the objective function here we are trying to do is we're trying to minimize the portfolio risk and maximize the return. And we also put a constraint uh, here that no one stock, but a stock should be uh, more than 10% of the portfolio. So you, you, you see that we, we got very good results in terms of not just the time in from 13 seconds from a traditional system to 
uh, 0.3 seconds, we are also getting better uh, portfolio results. Uh, as you can see from the, uh, the, the recommendations from the quantum systems. So let me show you the, the live demo and the efficient frontier, uh, the portfolios come in. Now, this is the, this is the demo for the system. Uh, you can actually, uh, I'm choosing a pre-built model. Uh, you can choose between various uh, indices. So in this case, we're taking down 30 and we're taking the last five years data. I've chosen uh, this data set and I'm doing a submit. And uh, this is the point where the data is being fetched. So the API call is being made to one of those data providers. And now we can actually see the last five years of performance of the Dow 30, right? So you can actually see the last five years data. Uh, these are the various stocks which form part of the uh, part of the index, right? You can actually see every single stock out here. And what is the annualized return uh, you got uh, across the last five years, which is about 24.5, right? So this is the, the, the graph itself in terms of across the years, what are the performances being? And we are waiting for the, the portfolio optimizer to load so that we will run the optimization algorithm and uh, show you the result. Uh, so this is the time is taken because we're fetching the data real time from one of the systems from the next external APIs. And once the data is loaded, we should be able to run the demo. Okay, now we got the data. We're going to run the optimized portfolio using a quantum system. Give us a minute while it runs. It takes a few seconds and we will get the results. Now the, the engine has done its job. Now you can actually see the results of an efficient frontier. Uh, the blue dots are the simulation. We are using Monte Carlo across several portfolio combinations. And the amber ones are the ones which the quantum system is provided. You can actually see from this experiment results that the, the quantum portfolio is consistently beating the, the classical approach or uh, the traditional approach, right? You can actually see uh, from, a, from a risk and a return perspective, each one of these, uh, you know, uh, the, the portfolio which the engine is recommending for each one of them. For example, if you take this particular um, amber dot of a recommended portfolio, which has got uh, a risk return of, uh, you know, uh, you can see from the axis, it is recommending uh, to choose these stocks from the Dow 30, right? It's, it's telling you to choose between Visa, Apple, and all the others, uh, and what should be your recommended allocation for each one of these stocks. And it is also telling you what could be the potential return and the risk from this entire portfolio. Similarly, each one of these amber dots, you can go here and you can see the risk return trade-off the engine is uh, suggesting based on the analysis of the last five years of data. So you can essentially play around with the system and pick up what works best uh, based on the risk profile, the age of the customer, the various life goals the customer has set, et cetera, et cetera. So it's essentially, you can see the, the benefits for you know, $100,000 if it's been invested, what could be the return and the trade-offs across the various portfolio options, okay? So let me jump into the second demo. The second demo is from the logistics space. I know this is the scenario discussion for financial services, but nevertheless, I thought I'll bring in the portfolio, uh, the, the logistics optimization along with the portfolio optimization because that gives an interesting contrast. So this is a scenario we're looking at last mile delivery. So this is a problem faced by many enterprises, logistics, retail, et cetera, where you need to deliver a certain good or an item uh, at the last mile. So this is uh, where you, the, 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 uh, the truck reaches a, a large depot and then you pick up the parcels and uh, you know load it into smaller trucks, and then these trucks go and deliver these boxes to the end customers. So this is the scenario we're going to show here. Uh, again, uh, for the first experiment, it was running at the DVF solver. Again, same thing. We are running the same uh, this experiment, the logistics optimization, also on a DVF system at the back end. Uh, I'm running a new experiment here. I'm choosing a truck which is 100. 
And this is just a fixed capacity. You can choose a fixed capacity or a varying capacity truck for today. I'm just choosing a fixed capacity truck. I'm just choosing a capacity as 100. And I'm, I'm uploading a, a data file, which is just an input file of the sample coordinates uh, for whom the packages needs to be delivered. So, so you can see that this data input, which is being made, has got the, the depot number, which is B0, the geographical coordinates, the, the lat longs, the customer demand, uh, what is the demand from the customer, uh, the time uh, the customer wants it to be delivered. These are constraints which are being programmed into the entire thing. I do submit, and this is the point uh, where the engine is allocating uh, the various customers. Uh, you know, these are the, you can see the customers and the people in a map. Right? These are the people and these are the various customers to whom the packages need to go from a last mile perspective. I'm doing assign packages to vehicles. So this is the time where the data is hitting the D-Wave system at the back end. Um, give us a few seconds. So typically, uh, you know, it, it gets you the results in usually 10 to 15 seconds. So you can actually see the power of uh, power of uh, cloud here because uh, previously this would not have been possible, and just because. The quantum systems are available on demand on the cloud. You are able to do this experiment uh, without needing to spend the millions of dollars yourself to buy and procure these systems, right? So, uh, so, so the engine has done its job. You can actually you actually saw that it took less than ten or fifteen seconds uh, to run the entire thing. I I talked about the various uh, allocations. Now the the algorithm has done its job in terms of identifying and recommending which vehicles need to go and and deliver which of these items. For example, it is it said that give, it's identified given the uh, you know uh, your dispatch scenario you're looking at, uh, it's recommended five vehicles and it is generating the routes for each one of these vehicles. So now if this is the final recommended route for all the vehicles. It is telling you that it will take 15 hours, 556 miles, and how. It, which route each vehicle should take. It's almost like a traveling salesman problem, but not really a completely traveling salesman problem, but some, something where you need to go and deliver these items uh, at one customer after the other. So you can actually choose uh, each one of these vehicles. Let me choose one of these vehicles, vehicle uh, two. It is telling you that this is the depot from which you are, from you are starting, go and deliver to customer one, come to customer two, come to, go to customer three and four and come back to depot for refilling. Similarly, for vehicle three, it is uh, telling the, uh, the driver that you start here, uh, go to customer one, two, three, four, and five, and come back. Right? So basically, very detailed recommendations. It is also calculated the, the cost incurred per vehicle, the capacity saved, the time taken, uh, the capacity utilized per truck, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually make a very informed decision rather than just a decision based on uh, any historical trend and data. So, it is real-time optimization. You can also bring in more complexities in terms of the, the traffic patterns or any of the other externalities uh, brought in by climate or any of the other uh, local disturbances you want to bring to the table. You can bring those optimization scenarios uh, as part of the algorithm also. Let me come back to the third scenario. I am in the interest of time, I'm not showing you the demo because we want to spend some time on answering Q and A's. So this is the anomaly detection scenario I spoke about, uh, where you're trying to identify anomalies in the credit card data set. Uh, there are there is anomalous data in terms of fraudulent transactions. Uh, we ran the same on classical systems versus quantum systems, and you can actually see the improvement. This is a one million plus data set we trained the engine on. This is a pure machine learning problem, and you can uh, you can see the improvement in terms of the precision, accuracy, as well as the F1 score across the board. Uh, for this when you ran in classical versus quantum system. Uh, that's it, uh, in the interest of time, I take a pause. You probably have five minutes for uh, Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Jay and Alex. We've answered uh, over 56 questions and we still have a lot of open ones we'll try to get to. If we don't get to answer your question in the next few minutes, we will respond over email. But I have a number of questions first. Um, so this one is for Alex. Uh, what is the frequency of use required to justify the claim that annealing reduces power consumption? The program doesn't run nearly as long, but a ton of power is consumed in keeping qubits super cooled, protecting against vibrations, et cetera. Uh, yeah, awesome question. So actually, um, 
there's a, I think there's a bit of a misconception, which is actually very little power goes into keeping our qubits cool, because if we pumped a bunch of power down there, we would be heating them up. Um, so actually, the once the system is cool, it becomes an extremely low power environment. Um, and, and really, the majority of the power used by our system is used for just cooling the um, the classical components that submit problems to the system. And that's why we're able to do sort of more computation for less power uh, than, than classical uh, counterparts. OK, thank you. Uh, question for Jay. I'd like to learn more about portfolio optimization using quantum computing. Can you recommend some reading material? So there are uh, quite a few reading material out there. Uh, I won't be able to read all of them, but uh, you will find some of the latest uh, reading material. Search for them in Oxide. Uh, that is the first place I would recommend if you're looking at this area, but we will be uh, offline. We will send you a list of recommended reading material, including sources for open source code also, which you can experiment with. OK, another question for Jay. As a software vendor, would it make sense for me to start exploring the business case for clients? Would clients see a monetary benefit from exploring the business cases now, or would you recommend this would mostly still be exploratory? So like I said, not all problem areas are ripe for a quantum intervention, uh, a quantum intervention, but there are certain types of problems which are here and now. And some of the problems I spoke about, uh, be the, the optimization problem, the machine learning problem, they are prime for adoption. And these are problems where enterprises can start uh, doing those implementations today. And I'm not talking about POCs, I'm talking about mature implementations. Uh, you have to choose wisely, choose the right use cases, and it will work wonders for you. Okay, question for Alex. What's the difference between using D-Wave through AWS Bracket or Leap? Um, short answer, there isn't really a difference. In fact, you can use uh, Ocean to access uh, in the AWS solver as well. Um, longer answer, uh, the hybrid solvers that I mentioned, which is really um, what allows you to simplify your flow and which is important for getting to sort of this application level are only available in Leap, um, as are some of the features I showed like uh, the, the IDE as well. But um, yeah, you, you can access the quantum computer directly through Bracket just as easily. Okay, let's see. Uh, cool portfolio optimization demo. What would you say is the main advantage point, e.g. performance, accuracy, adjusted returns, sharp, alpha, et cetera, from using a quantum annealing algorithm versus a classical computing algorithm to compute the efficient frontier to optimize in a given stock portfolio? Right. So uh, I showed you the, the slide which, which uh, gave you some real numbers in terms of the performance. Uh, you actually got the results in hardly 0.33 seconds as against 36, 36 seconds in a classical machine. So that is a, a, that is a straightforward benefit in terms of the time, uh, the exponential reduction in the time taken for the, uh, for the uh, algorithm to run. And of course, there are the additional benefits, uh, you know, be the risk return trade off. You can actually see the efficient frontier of the quantum uh, um, uh, portfolio recommendations in, uh, on a consistent basis, performing better than the classical system. So you, you, you get the benefit of not just the time, but also a better efficient frontier for your portfolio. Okay, another question for Jay. What kind of quantum classifier was used for fraud classification? Uh, RBMs are used here. The Sikton Boltzmann machines. Okay. Uh, can we incorporate different financial instruments, not only stocks, but mutual funds, bonds, equity, etc.? Yes, yes, you can, you can, you can experiment with all asset classes. Uh, it, you can even commodities, metals, uh, you name it. You can play around with any of these asset classes. We just did it with stocks because this data was easily and reliably available but uh, there is uh, no restrictions as to what asset classes you want to bring about. You can, you can try it with Bitcoin as well. Okay, uh, well, last question. And then again, we will try and answer all the others over email. How is the hybrid solver able to distinguish between the optimal use of the classical quantum approach and solving a problem? And that's for Alex. Um, so the, the way that we think about this is the, the quantum computer in this context is as like a coprocessor. You can imagine that you have uh, like when you run, say, a video game or, or lots of applications, you're running some parts on your CPU and some parts on your GPU. So our hybrid solvers use that same sort of approach, except it also includes a QPU. And in the same way that um, some, you know, you can kind of detect 
based on the features of the thing that you want to do, whether it's better to be using a CPU or a GPU, you can apply that same sort of logic to a QPU. And when in doubt, we run it on both because, you know, why not? Um, and we can use that to build statistics um, and, and, you know, improve our algorithm over time. Okay, with that, we're out of time. Thank you all so much for attending. Again, this has been recorded and will be posted to the D-Wave YouTube channel within the next day or so. So if you'd like to listen to it again um, or send us uh, some email and we'll be happy to answer your questions. I'll also take a look at LEAP and uh, thank you so much. We have webinars almost every month. So uh, stay tuned and hopefully you'll find out more. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. And thanks to the Emphasis team. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye -bye.